Hello, this is Robert Stearns. Hey, I want to thank you for tuning in. I really believe that learning is one of the greatest joys in life. And one of the greatest ways to learn is simply to have meaningful conversations, both with those who come from a similar background as yours, as well as those whose background might be very different. So my hope is that as we connect and converse with leaders from all around the world, that we will learn and grow together. If you're new with us, hit the subscribe button and we'll deliver the new episodes to you right away. So wherever you are, on a run, in the car, at the kitchen table with some coffee, welcome to the conversation. And we are live this evening and welcome Great to be together on this edition of Bishop and the Rabbi. So happy to have you all here uh, with me tonight. I just came from a, a wonderful uh, fellowship dinner with about a half dozen uh, pastors from throughout uh, the greater Buffalo area. And I've been looking forward to getting together tonight with all of you. Sign in. Tell us who you are, where you're watching from. Tell us, especially if it's your first time. We love having first time visitors on with us. And uh, tonight is going to be an amazing and special uh, evening. <clears throat> We've got so much going on, it's, it's hard to keep track of. So let me go through some things quickly. First of all, I want to say tonight is our very last night of our $15,000 challenge. We have a matching grant gift. One of our generous partners uh, felt led of the Lord um, to... Uh, so into Abraham's bread in Jerusalem. And so there is a matching grant. Uh, anything you give up to $15,000 will be matched uh, over the past several days. And many of you have responded. And that ends tonight. So this is your last opportunity. Uh, what is it? It's, it's a two for one sale, right? Like it's you get two donations for the price of one. That's awesome. So we're excited about that. Uh, number two, we had an amazing time with Alabama Celebrates Israel. I hope you all got to see it. If you didn't get to see it, you can go to our Facebook page, all right? And uh, you can re see the previews or the uh, replay there. We had an incredible night. And we are only weeks away from Buffalo Celebrates Israel. So please um, get the word out. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Kim Williamson from Honeybrook, Pennsylvania is a first time viewer. Kim, welcome. We are so happy that you're with us tonight. And everybody hit the share button because when you do, wonderful people like Kim learn about the broadcast and they tune in and they get connected to the Bishop and the Rabbi, which is the home of Jerusalem-centered Christianity. We believe that the faith of Jesus is what we should be walking in as his followers. And so we are committed to returning to the faith of Jesus, the faith of the early church. And that means walking alongside uh, of the Jewish people and the land of Israel. And tonight, I'm telling you what, Kim, you said you're a first time viewer. You could not have picked a better night because our rabbi tonight, honestly, to be honest, is one of the absolute all-time favorites of all rabbis that we have. And I'm going to introduce him in just a moment. Before I do, I have in my hand a, a stack of prayer requests that have come in. Uh, and we've been praying for these over the past several weeks. All of our partners, we pray for you by name every single Tuesday. Uh, we've done this now for probably two decades. Uh, every single Tuesday by name, we are praying for all of our partners. And uh, and uh, so we wanted to take a moment in this unique season. We're coming out of the high holy days. Uh, we're coming out of that season. We're, we're looking at Hanukkah coming up upon us. Uh, but we really want to be lifting up these prayers. Normally, I take these with me at this season every year to the Western Wall. And many of you have seen the videos. I go to the Western Wall. I present these before the Lord in at the Kotel. Um, but we're not able to be there this year. So we have to become a virtual Western Wall. We've got to become a virtual Kotel. So we're praying 
uh, for these prayer requests uh, tonight. We're praying for unity in this family that is experiencing, uh, they said, heightened fighting. And how many families are going through that right now with COVID, with the lockdown, with everything that's happening? It's adding a tremendous amount of stress uh, into family relationships. So we're going to pray for that. We're praying for a family member that struggles with PTSD. Uh, we're praying for a healing uh, tonight. Uh, someone has a, 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 a specific financial uh, burden that they're asking us to lift up before the Lord. This person is praying for victory over fear and confusion. Uh, and we're coming into agreement from that. Uh, wow, a lot of these tonight, a lot, several about fear. And, you know, can I just say that that's very understandable with what's happening in culture in general right now? Can I please listen to me? Political parties on all sides are going to maximize fear at this moment because fear drives behavior. Fear can be used to manipulate. So be careful that you are not coming under this kind of atmospheric pressure of fear right now that is being thrown at us in the middle of this heightened political season, okay? God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. This is what uh, the Bible says in the New Testament. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. This is a beautiful prayer request. Uh, my son is about to be released from prison. Please pray for his re-entry. What a, what a powerful time that those, those prison doors are opening literally. And let's just pray that this young man uh, finds blessing and connection um, back into um, society in this time. So we're going to lift these all up uh, before the Lord tonight. And uh, ask the Holy Spirit to touch each and every one. This one here, our, please pray for our son. He is in the Navy. Uh, he's been uh, deployed, uh, et cetera. So we're going to pray for all of these and all of our armed forces. So uh, just before we go and introduce our rabbi tonight, would you link your heart with mine and take a moment right now. Uh, and uh, absolutely, and there, if you've got a prayer request right now, uh, Robert Nicholas, so great to see you. Thank you for your text earlier. Just drop it in because we'll come into agreement if you've got a prayer request. And would you hit the share button, everybody? It really makes a difference if you hit the share button. Type in your prayer request real quick. Let's join together. We are a community of faith. We believe in a God who hears and answers prayer. So let's join together. Father, I thank you tonight that you are a God who is a very present help in time of trouble. You're not an idol. You're not distant. You're not far off. You are close. Your word says that you are close to those who are brokenhearted. So, Father, tonight we bring each of these prayer requests before you, and we are asking God that you would release your spirit, you would release your angels, you would release your presence. You are still a God who does miracles. You are still a God who turns situations around. So tonight, the Eagles Wings family, we release the spirit of faith. We release the spirit of hope. We release the spirit of joy. In the, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. So we lay a hold of joy that surpasses our circumstances. And we release joy as a weapon against stress, against fear, against anxiety, we release it tonight and we receive your answer for these prayer requests. And Father, we pray it tonight. Uh, as a Christian, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, our Jewish rabbi from Nazareth. Amen and amen. Let all God's people say amen. All right, everybody, the room is filling up nicely. And uh, of course, we have not, I know I'm yelling again. They keep telling you, Bishop, we bought you a really expensive microphone. You don't have to yell. I still yell. Just hold up a sign behind, say, stop yelling. That'll be, that's what I need. Um, uh, no, not you. I'm going to keep yelling at you. Uh, uh, so, 
All right. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get started here tonight. Uh, what was I going to say? I was saying something. Um, oh, we're on YouTube. That's what I was going to say. Social media post, everybody. Uh, we've got 60 in the Facebook room, but folks, we are also live now on YouTube. Go to YouTube forward slash Robert Stearns. YouTube forward slash Robert Stearns. Everybody go ahead and subscribe there quickly, please. Follow me on Instagram at Dr. Robert Stearns, Dr. Robert Stearns. Go to my public figure Facebook page. Do not go to the private page. It's got over 5,000 friends. I can't answer you there. Go to the public figure Facebook page. That's where we do almost all of our own posting. And please go to um, uh, Eagles Wings if you want to and hit the like on the Eagles Wings button. That will help us as well. I have been thinking of, I, I am yelling. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be yelling there, Hannah. I'm, I'll be quiet. I'll stop yelling. All right. Everybody, tonight is an amazing night. Uh, I am, no, I'm not yelling at your brother. No, I'm not, no, I'm not. <laughs> That's the sister of our tech person say, are you yelling at my brother? No, I did that yesterday, but I'm done. All right, everybody, let me bring it in here tonight. Things are crazy tonight. We are gonna, we're having fun. This is a special evening. All kidding aside, listen to me. Tonight's Parsha is is honestly one of the most powerful, pivotal parsha, parshot, parshiot, parshas in all of scripture. It is, it is mind boggling, the parsha that we're going to touch on tonight. It's extraordinary. That's number one. Number two, there could be nobody who could present this pivotal, epic parsha like I'm not, he's your friend. He's your friend, but he is my brother. And that is Rabbi Penny Dunner. Would you make welcome to the bishop and the rabbi, my brother, Rabbi, there he is, live from Beverly Hills, Rabbi Dunner. Let's make sure he's unmuted. Yes, he's unmuted. Rabbi, it's great to see you. It's always great to be on with you, Robert. I don't know what's taken us so long. It's been a couple of months since I've been on with you last. The first thing I want to say is, Rufua Shalema and Hatzlacha Rabba to all those who sent prayers in for you to mention, and I want to add my prayers to the prayers that you said Amen. a few moments ago, because I want them to all be successful and to not have fear and to not go through the challenges and difficulties that they are experiencing. That's Rabbi, do you, do you agree, and I'm sorry, do you agree that right now there's just fear in the atmosphere everywhere because of the political climate? I, I think that we've never experienced something more devastating in that sort of social, psychological um, sphere than we are yep. experiencing right now. And I think that the media and particularly social media is not helping in this situation. And uh, for some, it may be useful and helpful if they turned off their social media and turned up and uh, didn't look at the newspapers or watch TV shows until, if I may dare say it, uh, after the election, let things calm down and let's get try and get back to normal. The COVID crisis is enough for us to cope with. Let's Let's just try and maintain a status quo of our normal lives rather than feed into this fear atmosphere that seems to be so pervasive. That's the first thing. The second thing is I'd like to contribute to your campaign tonight. Um, oh. Both Sabine and I would like to contribute $180. Oh. As you know, 18 is a very important number in Judaism. 18 is the same numerical value as chai, as life. And we, I know that uh, we can't contribute the full $15,000, but I would like to encourage others who are watching this program to contribute to your wonderful appeal to make sure that we can raise enough money to supply those in Jerusalem with what you are doing. And I visited your centers in Jerusalem, yes. and I know that you do incredible work. So I am very proud to be associated with this campaign, and I'm delighted to be able, together with Sabine, to donate $180 towards it. And that's the second yeah. thing I wanted to say. The third thing I wanted to say is how appreciative I am to be on this broadcast because you are truly a brother. We have celebrated Simchas together and we have been together for so many different situations. We've been Shabbat, we've been together to Israel. We've toured the whole of Israel. We've seen the Jewish Israel, the Christian Israel, and mm -hmm. together, 
we are forging forward for the betterment of humankind, not just one particular view of the world, not just Christianity or Judaism, but together, right. shoulder to shoulder, we are going to try and forge ahead and make the world a better place. So it's a delight to be on with you. Thank you for inviting me. Well, Rabbi, you know how I feel about you and your wonderful family. And in a moment, we're going to ask a specific question about your family. But I have had my, and by the way, not only myself, my children have been with me to Shabbat in your home on many happy occasions. And to be at a Shabbat dinner at the home of the, the Dunner family uh, is, is to experience something uh, absolutely extraordinary. Um, the power of the spirit that is evident at your Shabbat table, when your family all begins to sing, many people don't know that Rabbi uh, is a, has a beautiful, beautiful singing voice. I think you also play guitar. And, and really, I, I think you carry some of the nefesh, some of the mantle of Shlomo Karlebach, uh, who was this, this wonderful psalmist. He was like a modern day King David. And, um, and, uh, so I've, I've been in your home so many times. My children have been in your home, your children and my children are friends. Uh, and that, that leads me to ask about, uh, this amazing son of yours, Mayer. And Mayer has just, um, I don't know if he's made Aliyah, but he has, he's gone to Israel and he is serving in the IDF. And I think we have a picture. There he is right behind me. This is your incredible son. You're in Sabina's credible son, Mayor. And what was it like for you as a father to take your son and to say, here I am and my son is becoming a member of the IDF in the reborn state of Israel. Your grandparents could never have imagined such a thing. It's, it's beyond incredible. And every day is a day of pride and joy. Every time he calls us and every time we see him in the uniform of Israel Defense Forces, of Tzahal, and we see him serving the Jewish people in the state of Israel, we experience such incredible pride. And he is not just a soldier for the Israeli army. He's also a soldier of God. And every morning he wakes up his fellow soldiers for shacharit so that they can all pray together before they begin whatever it is that they have to do in their soldiering. They make sure that they devote some time to God. And he is, in fact, I would say, more devoted to his faith and to his religion and to God serving in the Israeli army than he ever was in high school or elementary school. And we are incredibly proud of him, both Sabine and I. We just cannot fathom, as you say, our grandparents and our ancestors could never believe that there would ever be a state of Israel. But to think that their own descendant would one day serve in the Israeli army, I don't think there could be anything that they would be more proud of. Well, it's incredible. And I want to ask every single person on, we're well over 65 people right now in the Facebook room, and then we've got the YouTube room, and everybody, please hit the share button quickly. Uh, but I want to ask everybody to add Mayer Dunner to their daily prayer list. I want you to just once a day uh, lift up the name of Mayer Dunner as he's serving in uh, the Israeli army, and we, and we declare over him, Hine lo yanum velo yeshan shomer Yisrael. He who keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. And, and the Lord will watch over Meir and the Lord will guard him in every way as he's serving as a soldier in the Israeli army. So please, if the Lord witnesses that to your heart, add Meir to your prayer list and pray for him on a daily basis. And, and Rabbi, it's just so fantastic to see you. And you and I have so much that we have done, but much, much more that we want to do, and Baruch Hashem will, Bizrat Hashem will do together. We're going to do uh, tremendous things. The first thing I need to ask you, even before we begin our conversation, yes, is why did this particular broadcast begin at least Eastern Standard Time at 9 11? Yes, yes, yes. I forgot to mention that. Thank you. So, for those who are new to Bishop and the Rabbi, people say, well, this is kind of a morbid, you know, is this is this an honor of 
9-11 or what's happening, et cetera, et cetera. So no. So there is a very famous scripture. It's a famous scripture for all Jews and Christians, but specifically it means a lot to the Kanfei Nesharim family, to the Eagle's Wings family, and it's Amos 9-11, Amos chapter 9, verse 11, and it says, In that day I will restore the tabernacle of David that has fallen down. I will repair its ruins, rebuild its breaches, and restore it as it used to be, so that they may <clears throat> possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord who will do these things. Behold, the plowman will overtake the reaper, the treader of grapes, he who sows, and all Israel shall be regathered in that day. And so Amos 9.11 speaks of this mystical moment of the coming of the age of Mashiach, the age of Messiah. And while Rabbi Dunner and I, in one way, are of different faiths, in a very real way, if I can say it, Rabbi, we are united in faith in the coming of Messiah. We, we don't yet see his identity clearly. Uh, we see him as Jesus. Uh, you see him as someone other than Jesus. You, but, but we believe that there is coming Messiah, and we feel the nearness of his approach. And we have a trust that somehow God is going to clarify all of these things as we move forward. So we well, started we know that in, in Judaism, we have something called Kabbalah, which is Jewish yep. mysticism. And Jewish mysticism doesn't speak about Mashiach. Of course it does, but it talks a lot about Ikvata de Mashiach, the Messianic age or the Messianic era. And I think that rather than focus on the individual Messiah, and no doubt it is important to imagine who that person might be, when he arrives as the savior of the human race, of the God-believing human race. But much more importantly, we must think of the messianic era, and particularly because we share this incredible passion for the rebirth of Israel and the state of Israel. You know that the messianic era, as I do, cannot exist without the ingathering of the exiles, from the four corners, as it were, of the earth that there must be an ingathering of the Jewish nation from all corners, as has happened over the past many decades since the creation of the State of Israel, that we've seen the Jewish nation reborn in its land, in the land of its inheritance, in the land of the Bible, the land of Israel. We know that the Messianic era is upon us, and therefore we pray for the Messiah to come. And it's not important how we individually perceive Messiah, what is important is that we embrace the concept of a messianic era. Well, amen, and and uh, amen. We could go down that road in discussion, and, and maybe we should do another uh, broadcast specifically on that, and maybe with our good friend, help me with his name, that we had on the other day, who's the expert in this, uh, Rabbi Hajioff. I don't know if you know yeah. Rabbi Lawrence Hajioff. Well, I introduced uh, him to you. Oh, yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. That is right, you did. But Rabbi, we've got to get to tonight's Parsha because it is one Absolutely. of the absolute best ever. So as we go to the Parsha, everybody, last chance, hit the share button, please. Everybody share, share, share. And also, uh, please uh, thank you, Rabbi Dunner, for this $180 gift tonight to Abraham's Bread. If you'd like to join Rabbi tonight, any gift you're giving, it ends uh, somebody told me it ends the day after tomorrow, but it ends very soon. We're in the middle of this $15,000 um, matching pledge. So we are in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, through Genesis 17, 27. Genesis 1 through Genesis 17. And this is the Parsha called Lech Lecha. Lech Lecha. This is God's fame. God, the interrupter. God, the interrupter, God who interrupts our lives. I love how many stories of the Bible God comes down and interrupts individuals, nations, tribes, situations. And so we find not Abraham, we find Avram, for his name has not yet been changed. He is living in Ur of the Chaldees. 
the concept of monotheism, the concept of one God does not exist in the earth. Mankind only understands themselves at the whim and whimsy of various gods. There's the river God, and there's the harvest God, and the sun God, and the moon God, and all of the various gods. And somehow in the midst of the cacophony of all of these voices, Avram, Abram, hears one voice that penetrates and elevates and connects and vibrates louder and stronger than all of the others. And that voice says to, uh, to Avram, to Abram, Lechacha, get up and go to the land that I will show you. Rabbi, teach us Lechacha. Well, first of all, I, I, I know how important chapter 12, verse 3 is for the Christian community. Those who bless Abraham will be blessed. Those who curse and deride Abraham will themselves find themselves in difficulty. And I think that that is the crux of all belief, of all faith, that we live in a world where, in fact, there is a binary choice. Are you going to buy into what God wanted from us or are you going to reject it? Is your soul going to be uh, imbibed with the spirit of God? Or are you going to totally reject the possibility of God being involved in your life? Those who buy into the Abrahamic faith, into the faith of monotheism, into the rejection of paganism, into the rejection of any type of material association with God, they will be blessed. They are part, in, in a sense, of the Jewish faith. Those Christians who buy into this concept, of the Abrahamic faith, of monotheism, of a belief in God, they are buying into this blessing, which is first expressed in chapter 12, verse 3 of Genesis. But that very same verse says that those who reject God, those who reject the foundation of God in this world, and that is Abraham, the founder of our religious faith, they will be cursed. Their, their fate is not to exist beyond their own lives. They have th really what they have done is said that our life is nothing more than our material, our physical existence on this world and nothing beyond it. And therefore, the blessing is those who bless the Jewish faith, who, those who bless the Abrahamic faith and the curse, those who will not succeed and ultimately they cannot endure beyond their own lifetimes and beyond, in fact, the things that they do on a regular basis are those who reject the existence of God as represented by Abraham. Abraham is the emblem. He's the totem of the Jewish faith and of the belief in God. That's the first thing I want to tell you about this week's parasha. But much more importantly, and it's something about which I wrote in a more parochial way today in an article that I have disseminated that Abraham was a believer in God. He had discovered God, He'd, he prayed to the sun, and at the end of the day, the sun set, there was no sun. Uh, okay, so he prayed to the moon and the stars, but then at the end of the night, there was no moon, there were no stars, the sun came back up. So which one was more important? And he decided that all of the pagan faiths that we discussed earlier were of no value, that ultimately, if there was as we say in the modern parlance, and I've said it many times, if there was indeed a big bang, there had to be a big banger. Somebody <laughs> who created that bang. And that was the revelation of Abraham. Abraham came up with this idea that ultimately there was an omnipotent God. He was the first monotheist in a polytheistic swamp, in a pagan swamp. And he believed in God, in awe of the Chaldees, he was fine, everything was going good. And suddenly he began to hear the voice of God. And the voice of God said to him, Lech lecha, go out, me'artzecha, from your land, mimoladadcha, from the place that you were born, mi'beitavicha, from the home of your father. Get out of your comfort zone. Believing in God is not enough. There's no such thing as faith without challenge, no pain, no gain. If there's no pain involved in your faith, then your faith 
is not worth anything. Wow. And unless you are willing to go boldly beyond your comfort zone, to explore things which are beyond your regular life, there is no such thing as faith. God demands of us that we test ourselves. And we know that, that Abraham went through in the Midrashic sources, we talk about 10 tests. It says in Avot, and it's in chapter 5 of Avot, um, uh, Mishnah 3, it says that Abraham went through separate tests. We don't know what those tests are. We can speculate there's different variations as to what those tests were. We know that the final one was the Akedah when he was asked to sacrifice his son. And I know how important that is for the Christian faith. But the, the, the point is that Abraham was tested. The first test that we know from the Bible is the test of him being asked to leave his comfort zone. Test your faith. Don't be comfortable in your faith. And I speculated today in the article that I wrote that perhaps there were other people of faith in the time of Abraham, people who didn't believe in the pagan gods and believed in God and believed in a monotheistic faith. But they didn't stand up to this challenge. They didn't go to the land of Canaan. They didn't arrive in the land of Canaan and discover that there was a famine. They didn't go to Egypt and have to hide their wife because they might die and get killed by those who wanted an adulterous relationship with Sarah. They didn't experience the difficulties of a man in his 70s who to quite happily have retired. We all retire in our 70s, hopefully, right? And yet Abraham only came into his own at the very end of his life, as it were, in his old age, and became this emblematic hero, this mentor of faith, the person who believed in one God, and could, who could consistently demonstrate but with test after test and with trial after trial that his faith in God would not be diminished by anything that was thrown at him. And that indeed is our lives. How many times in our lives have we experienced and faced a difficulty and thought to ourselves, where is God? And the question is not, where is God? It's, where am I? Where am I in the face of God? Where am I in the face of this challenge? Can I still be faithful to God despite the difficulties that I'm experiencing? If I can, then, then I'm Abraham. If I can't, I've not managed to pass that test. Well, first of all, Rabbi, you know, to, to be around you is to, is to, is to hear uh, something that's lost in the Western world, and that is the gift of the orator. You are not a speaker. You are an orator. And uh, it, is, it is remarkably refreshing. And, uh, and you know how much you remind me of one of my early mentors, Rabbi Gerald Meister, who had the same accent as yours and who was my early mentor. And I think when, when he went uh, to glory, uh, you know, God, we, we met not long after he passed. And right. I'm so grateful for you. Rabbi, I want to touch on this theme. <clears throat> Abram hears the voice of God. The voice says, go. And then the voice in Abram's natural, you know, it's unspoken in the text, but it's implied. Abram says, go where? And God says, you're going to go to the land that I'm going to show you. The destination is undetermined. It's undetermined. And so the journey requires not simply a crisis of faith where I have the lightning bolt moment that I hear the voice of God. The journey requires that I cultivate a sense of God's presence and God's leading and God's confirmation in my life for the entirety of the journey. Because how was God going to show the land to Abram? You know, it didn't it didn't appear with mile markers and you know exits like the New Jersey Turnpike. No. I, I always think of that when we're we're on the we're on the plane and you know the <laughs> screen in front of you and you can press and it can show you exactly where you are on your journey. You right. left one place and no, no, you left I come from London, you left London, you're going to Los Angeles, you can chart exactly where you are on that journey and how long it's going to take you. You are one hour and fifteen minutes from your destination. Didn't happen to Abraham, did it? 
Abraham was sold a ticket. He knew his point of departure. He had no concept of his point of destination. He had no idea where he was going or how long the journey would take or what would happen to him when he arrived in the place where he was going. That's a true journey. It's not the journeys that we have today. You know, All the uncertainty that we have in our lives today doesn't compare, it pales by comparison to that which Abraham went through. And think about it. Think about the trust you have for having God. So is, isn't, isn't, isn't his life the original example of that axiom that's thrown around so much today that the journey is the destination? Because Abram's journey became this crucible in which his relationship with God became refined and strengthened and emblematic for all of us. We all live off of the fruit of the lessons that Abram and then Isaac and then Jacob, the lessons of their spiritual pilgrimage are still speaking to us today because in a very real sense, their journey was their destination. I'm going to say two things in response to that. The first is I said many, many years ago that planning a holiday is always much more enjoyable than the holiday. <laughs> <laughs> you put all this effort in, you look at the pictures of the hotel, you look at the pictures of the destination and you, plan that then you go on the holiday and it's over in a few days but you put in weeks of preparation uh, and I, i'm going to use that to as an introduction to my second comment in response to what you've just said our life is a journey we're all heading to a destination we know that there is what we refer to in in jewish um uh, in jewish tradition as gan eden as the garden of eden or as uh, the world to come olam haba and ultimately, everything that we do is a preparation of our neshama, of our soul, for the world to come. And if we treat our lives as the destination, that's what I described earlier, that's paganism. Right. If everything we do in our lives, that's the ultimate purpose of our existence, then we really miss the point. But if we understand that we are on a journey, mm. our life is a journey, our life is not a destination, that we are going from stop to stop, from place to place, ultimately heading towards one direction. And I hate to say it, I know that we are all in human denial about the ultimate mortality of all humans, which is that we're going to die. doesn't matter when it happens. You know, they used to say three, three score years and 10, right? Hopefully we're going to live a little bit longer than that. In Jewish tradition, we say, Ad esrim shana, until 120 years. Don't know that we're going to live that long, but ultimately we understand that when we reach that 120-year destination, that is the point at which we can really reflect on what the purpose of our life was and should have been. And Avraham Avinu, I think, is the first person of faith that is mentioned in the Torah. We have other people that are mentioned in the Bible and Hebrew Scripture before him. We have Adam. We know that he communicated with God. We have Noah. We know that he communicated with God. But Abraham is the first person of faith that is mentioned in Hebrew scripture. He is the first person who is sent, in a sense, on a journey from one place to another. And his life continues to be a journey until its end. Then we have Isaac, and Isaac is his son. But Isaac says to, to his own son, to Jacob, my experience as the son of my father is not sufficient to create a Jewish nation. You need to go on a journey. You need to go and find your wife in another country. And in fact, Jacob's life from then on was a journey. And, and he went to Egypt. And it's only out of the crucible of Egypt, the slavery and the exile in Egypt, and ultimately the redemption and salvation that we understand uh, happened, that we merited to receive the Bible, the Torah at Mount Sinai. It is only through the journey that we can merit great experiences, that we can merit the presence of God. Rabbi, we, we could, I'm telling you, the, first of all, it's just so rich. Um, and I have so many questions, but you know, we have to press on. We, we, we cannot leave this Parsha without going to really, frankly, the pivotal moment in history, which is Genesis 15. Yes, the covenant. Because God cuts covenant with Abraham. And 
we as Christians, and specifically we as Jerusalem-based Christians, we believe this is the covenant that we have been, uh, in Pauline terminology, we've been grafted into. We have been connected to this covenant. Uh, but the roots, we have the we have the uh, the logo behind. The roots are right here, and so we're going to go to the absolute root right here, which is Genesis 15. This unbelievable moment that Hashem, the Lord, comes to Abram in a vision and cuts covenant with him. Would you speak to us about the covenant? Because out of this comes the Jewish people, the land of Israel, and eventually, it's not mentioned here by name, but eventually the Or Hagoyim, the light to the Gentiles that, that fills literally the whole earth. It all comes back to this seminal moment of covenant. Talk to us about the covenant, Rabbi. I want to talk to you conceptually about covenant, but before I do, I would invite all of those who are watching to go onto my website, uh, www.rabbidunner.com. I have a four-part Bible class specifically on the covenant in Genesis 15. I would encourage you all to log on and to uh, to find it and to you just go onto the library in the website and go on to the Torah portion of Lech Lecha and you'll discover a four-part Bible class specifically on this covenant. And obviously, I'm not going to spend the next three and a half minutes summarizing a four-hour Bible class. But I would say this. The concept of covenant is very, very important. When people get married to each other, it's a form of covenant. We dedicate ourselves to each other. We have a covenant to each other that we will be faithful to each other and that we will be loyal to each other and that we matter to each other. It's important. Without a covenant, there cannot be, in a sense, permanence in a relationship. It's ephemeral. It's flippant. It's temporary. But a covenant somehow underpins. It creates a fundament. It creates a basis it creates a foundation for a relationship that's going to outlast even those people who enter into the covenant. You know, in, in legal terms, a covenant is something which is almost irrevocable. When you create a covenant in legal terms, for example, if a building is held in covenant, it's a totally different thing than if somebody buys it or sells it. It's much harder to get out of it. Why is that? Because the word covenant conveys this concept of permanence, of something which is more important than just the relationship between the two people who entered into it, something that's actually greater than the sum of its parts. We have a covenant. Abraham and God entered into a covenant. He has a vision. God appears to him, and God says to him, you're not just an ordinary human being. You're not Adam. That was a bit of a failure. You're not Noah. That didn't really work out. You're Abraham. And we don't know how many other characters there were over the course of that early history of humanity who might have been successful, but have been airbrushed or written out of the historical record. We know that Abraham was successful. He passed the tests of faith and he entered into a covenant with God. And that covenant was, by the way, not some kind of gift that God gave to him, but it was a, um, a legacy of responsibility. When you mm-hmm. enter into a covenant, wow. it's a legacy of responsibility. My goodness. As the Jewish nation, as the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we are not simply people who have a special relationship with God because he gave us a gift. We are his ambassadors. We are his representatives. We are God on this earth. We have the ability to spread the word of God and to create a covenant of God, not just for ourselves, but for others. And that was only possible because Abraham was willing, as I said before, in a swamp of paganism to take a stand and to say, there is only one God. And what he wants for us from us is to be his representatives and to serve him in this physical, material world. And we all can enter into a covenant with God. 
It's not just limited to Abraham. Abraham may have been the first one to do it, but he was the first of many. You and I, Robert, you're in a covenant with God. I mean, I, I am yeah. in a covenant with God. We are. We have decided to dedicate our lives to represent God in the face of modern paganism, of modern day denial. And that's what we're doing. We are in Abraham's covenant. And together, we will make sure that all those who don't see Abraham in the world around them will be exposed to what it means to be a God believer. We will make sure that all those who visit our tent, as the three angels did, will bless God and be part of God's blessing. Rabbi, two things, and, and I want to encourage everybody to hang with us tonight. I know we're going a tiny bit long, but this is so good. It's so rich, it, rich it's so deep. And please, if you haven't already, quickly hit the share button, get the word out. This is how we grow uh, our, our community. Rabbi, speak to two things. Number one, you know, you've been, we always, we talk about, I'm in covenant with God. God made covenant with Abraham. But really, really, doesn't a closer reading of this text even let us know that in the truest sense, God made covenant with himself? Because it says that it put Ab he put Abram into a deep sleep. He, he put Abram into a deep sleep and God himself walked through the places of that sacrifice. God declaring by that, that Abraham, even when you and your descendants, be they your biological descendants or your spiritual faith family descendants, even when they fail to keep this part of the covenant, I will keep my part of the covenant and I will see that the covenant comes to pass because I, the Lord, do not lie. I keep my promises to a thousand generations. Isn't there a certain way in which God obligates himself to the covenant in putting Abraham to sleep and swearing by himself? That's a wonderful thought. You're, you're venturing and delving into areas of religious mysticism, which are possibly beyond me. But I would say this, that God only created the world because he wanted humanity to exist so that they could recognize him. If it just in broad brush terms, God is perfect. Maimonides speaks of God as the epitome of perfection, in which case, why would God have created a world that is full of imperfection? And we don't have a clear answer to that. The Talmud talks about debates that existed among the rabbis on this very topic. And of course, the Kabbalah talks about this at great length. We don't have good answers to this question because I think that it's beyond our comprehension. But one thing we do know, that if God created the world, he only created it so that we could match up to expectations that are unexpected, that humanity can live up to beyond itself. Abraham is the original example of a human being who took himself from a world of God denial when there was no such thing as God and invented the concept of God, totally self-generated. He was the ultimate, the epitome of what it means to be a God believer in a world of God denial. And as a result of that, I guess that the best way to express it is that God took him and said, right, I'm not letting that go. That's a treasure. That's an unbelievable, incredible um, example of exactly what it is that I wanted from the world. I wanted humanity, which is an animal. We're all animals, right? We're no different right. than, how, how different are we from chimpanzees and gorillas? Here we have an Avraham Avinu, who's a human being, who's in DNA terms only less than 1% away from a chimpanzee, who's come to this recognition that God exists. I'm going to take him. I'm holding on to that. I'm not letting that go. I'm going to make sure that that is per per perpetuated beyond his own lifetime. Beautiful. And that is the idea of the covenant. You're speaking about God. God, of course, generates this. God creates the platform, and then he holds our hand, 
and make sure that we can go through with it. That is what he did with us at Mount Sinai when he gave us the Torah. The angels in the Midrash argue with God and say, don't give the Torah, don't give the Hebrew scripture, don't give this holy scripture to humanity. They're not, they're not worthy of it. Don't give it to the Jewish nation. They're a useless nation. They're going to let you down. And Moses, together with God, he holds Moses in the Midrash, holds on to God's throne. And he argues with the angels and he convinces, as it were, on behalf of God, the angels, that giving the Jewish nation the Torah is a worthwhile exercise. Similarly with Abraham, there's no such thing as a covenant without somebody who is a worthy partner in that covenant. But of course, we're always going to be minority partners in a relationship with God. God is so far beyond our comprehension, so far beyond anything that we could ever conceive, that anything that happens with God is always going to be 99.9% .9 God and 0.1% humanity. That's it. As long as that 0.1% is there, please make sure that 0.1% is there. Make sure that you're there alongside the project and the other 99.9% .9 is going to come along and make sure beautiful that you can be carried forward in the arms of God. Now, I can't believe you just ended with that phrase because it's exactly where I'm going. You said we'll be carried forward in the arms of God. What a beautiful Beautiful phrase. It's exactly where I'm going right now. Here's, here's as and we're coming to the close, but hang tight. Here's this beautiful uh, writing. I don't know if you have this within the Jewish tradition, but this is a, it's a Christian poem, as it were. And it makes me think because, you know, our dear friend Mark Gerson is commenting. He says, God initiates the covenant and God obligates himself he does not even ask Abraham to walk through the pieces. God takes the covenant upon himself. That's verse 17. It says, when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appeared and passed through the pieces. God obligated himself. Listen to this writing and everybody let this encourage you in this moment. Rabbi just said that we are carried through in the arms of God. It says, one night I had a dream. I was walking along the beach with my Lord. Across the sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One footprint set belonged to me and one belonged to the Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints and I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest and most difficult times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me. And so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said that if I would follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome and painful times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand, God. When I needed you most, why would you leave me? God whispered to my ear, my precious child, I love you and I will never leave you. Never, ever. During your trials and testings, when you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I was carrying you. And this is what the Lord does for us. And this is how the covenant comes to pass because we are carried in the arms of God. We've talked tonight about two profound lessons from this Parsha. We've talked about hearing the voice of God. Lechaha, get up. And if we hear the voice of God, it will always call us to a journey out of our comfort zone. Rabbi admonished us tonight, if our faith is not leading us to a place of discomfort, then it's not true faith. So we must be willing to take that journey in God and go to the land that God has called us to and understand that the very act of our going is a spiritual dynamic that is causing a legacy impact for our children and our grandchildren and those generations that will follow. And then he brought us to chapter 15, the covenant that changed all of history and that we are all walking in the blessing of. And together, 
my precious Eagles Wings family, old and new, we have been on a journey all of these years. Since the early 90s, that first trip to Jerusalem that changed everything, we have been those who have been, according to Psalm 24, ascending the hill of the Lord. What do we do every day? We go higher. We go higher in God. We go higher in the Spirit. We go higher in our faith. We go higher in prayer. We go higher in good deeds. We go higher in walking in love with God and with people, that we would be those who release light and hope into a world that desperately needs both. I want to ask you tonight to hit the share button. I want to encourage you tonight, if you've not yet become a monthly partner with Eagle's Wings, uh, you're going to be hearing more about this in the immediate future, but we are going to be launching a partners campaign in the near future. So be looking for those details. Be praying for these prayer requests. Be praying for Meir. Can you put Meir's uh, photo up one more time? Uh, I want you to be praying for Meir Dunner, who has uh, just joined the um, IDF. Can you imagine? Listen, church. Listen to me. Here is a young man who lives in Beverly Hills. He lives in Beverly Hills, walking distance to Rodeo Drive. And what does he do? He responds to what we heard tonight. Get up and go. Go where, God? Go to the land of your forefathers. To do what, God? To join the army. To live in a tent. To sweat. To to, 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 to exercise, to get up at the crack of dawn, to enter an austere, disciplined lifestyle. Why? So I can make you a Shomrei Achumot, a modern-day watchman on the walls of Zion. That is what Rabbi Dunner's son is doing, and we can see the pride of a father beaming on the rabbi's face. And so you and I are all called to be these spiritual watchmen on the walls, like Pastor Anthony Flores and his wonderful church in California, who we love and thank God for the partnership of Pastor Anthony's church and all of our wonderful Eagles Wings partners. We love you and we salute you. Now, tomorrow night, we're coming together at 6 p.m. We'll do a, a quick uh, brachot, the, the Shabbat brachot, very quickly. It's 10 minutes, but it's beautiful. Sunday morning, I'll be preaching live from the tab.org. Sunday morning, 10 a.m., the tab.org. But Rabbi, we want to give you the last word this evening. Summarize for us, synthesize for us, and then in whatever way you feel best, go ahead and close our evening. Well, the first thing is I'd like to thank you and all those who are part of your wonderful church and your Eagle's Wings community for having invited me and for being a friend of the Jewish community and supporters of the land of Israel and the state of Israel. I fondly recall that I spent uh, a wonderful weekend or week with you in Buffalo two, three, four years ago, whenever it was, when Buffalo celebrated Israel. And I look forward to my return visit to Buffalo when I yes. can do so again. You spoke about Alabama. I went to Huntsville, Alabama, and yes. I, did, I did that. Huntsville celebrates Israel as well in the church uh, in uh, Pastor Rusty's church, and it was an absolutely beautiful event. By the way, Huntsville, Alabama is the home of the uh, manufacturing facility that creates the Iron Dome for, the, for Israel, for the state of Israel, that protects the citizens of Israel from rockets that come from Palestinian terrorists in Gaza. So Huntsville is a beautiful place, and the prayers of Huntsville don't just reach Alabama, they reach the land of Israel. And I want to Celebrate Israel with all of your followers, Bishop Stearns, not just in Huntsville and in Buffalo, but in every place that they may be in the United States and beyond. And I bless you all that you should have the blessings of God and the blessings of Abraham in your lives and in the lives of all those you love. Amen. Amen and amen. God bless you all. We love you. And remember, keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem. God bless you.